Um, I'm not going to uh, give a very detailed presentation after the very detailed uh, methodological uh, work that's been uh, suggested to you. I was thinking uh, that it's already a privilege to be able to speak of philosophy within this type of setting. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna uh, confirm what might be some of your uh, presuppositions about philosophy by making something very complex and abstract. So I'd like to make it more conversational. And uh, I've pretty much structured it around three ideas. Uh, one is that, well, we're doing science here, but exactly how are we to think of the science that we're doing? From an academic point of view, I'd like to give a few <coughs> ideas on that. The other, the other aspect is that, well, uh, probably since about 2008, there's been a certain uh, request for a part of philosophy to enter into discussions regarding business and organizations and governance, and particularly ethics. So what type of ethics exactly are we talking about? What is the philosophical tradition behind ethics? And what are some of the big systems, the big authors? What's the philosophical terminology also that we use when we speak of ethics? So we're gonna to touch on that. And the third point, which is really the first point, which is really the, the, the invitation to have this conversation, is the idea that, well, you're, you, you're working on something called a doctor philosophy. So where is the philosophy in all of this? I think it's very concretely found in every one of the steps, although not necessarily named as such. And this is one of the, one of the dramas of philosophy. Historically, philosophy, as we know, is the mother or the matrix of all sciences. What that means exactly is that within philosophy, uh, different sciences were created. We can cite physics, we can cite biology, uh, we can cite sociology, psychology, uh, theology, history, logic, ethics, Morality. I can go on. There are some fields that are not directly related to philosophy, like chemistry, let's say. But what typically happens is that when these fields you know, separate themselves off from philosophy, there isn't much reference back to philosophy. In fact, for the, the exact sciences, for the natural sciences, whenever a researcher is acute, well, Whenever a researcher is characterized as doing philosophy instead of hard science, you know, this spells out probably the end of their scientific career, that they moved outside of the fields. You know, so the suggestion that a scientist is working on philosophy or doing philosophy is something uh, you know, very negative to the characterization of their research work. Now there's another tendency that's happening these days in the university setting, and this is more dramatic because it has to do specifically with the university setting, is the call to do interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary methodology. Transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary methodology is precisely what we do in philosophy. And in a certain sense, transdisciplinary or inter interdisciplinary methodology is what uh, science is, the other science, sciences are are characterizing their renewed uh, collaboration and conversation with philosophy. But they prefer to call it interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, instead of a renewed approach to philosophy. So this contributes, to a certain extent, to wiping philosophy out. And we know that, you know, at least in these past few decades, after a glorious history of dominating the university setting, uh, philosophy or doing philosophy is partly to defend its rights to exist as a science, to characterize what it is exactly as a science. These days it's classified as a, as a human science most of the time. Philosophy is not a human science. So I hope that in this discussion we'll be able to touch on a few of these, these questions and uh, perhaps clarify a bit uh, what uh, what philosophy does to academic research, and how philosophy is acting, at least latently, in the type of research you're doing. 
much as it deals with business, and as we know, I mean, business has not been a traditional partner of philosophy, but what I've learned, partic not directly from my academic studies, but mo more and mostly from giving English consulting conversation or translating or a type of coaching or very advanced level cultural English conversations with executives of companies, is that after a certain amount of time, executives want to have their cultural supplement. They're interested in philosophy, and philosophy, in fact, has a place, and then they lament the fact, let's say, giving an example, the power sector, the electric power sector of Brazil, they lament the fact that within the engineering program, there are no philosophy programs, that there are no philosophy courses, no philosophy disciplines. But this exists as an interest later on. So well, one of the questions that philosophy deals with is precisely the most fundamental question, what is science? You know, this isn't necessarily a scientific question. It's not something that scientists will ask themselves. You know, they have their program, they have you know, their experimental basis, they have their, their blueprints on what they, they have to execute. They have their guidelines for getting grants. As we know, one of the big problems for philosophy is a whole granting scheme. You know, philosophy can be practiced without any type of money. You know, we create our own thought experiments. We don't need instruments, whereas it helps to have computers. So at least on that basis, we have some type of reliance on instruments. But uh, you know, the question itself of what is science is something that philosophy has, has developed. And I'd like to go into that a little bit later. But just opening up on some of the questions that, that we'll, we'll discuss. And, and I'd like to really maintain the conversational mode. So if you do have any questions along the way, please do, uh, do uh, do ask them. So how has science been divided in contemporary academic and research institutions? And now, you know, I'm shifting back to a more traditional sense of science because, as we know, also big science, uh, the hard sciences, the exact sciences, have come to dominate the use of the word science. So it's been a struggle within the social sciences uh, to keep using the word science. Now, that's also reflected within social sciences by a certain arbitrary ad hoc division in which you have the applied social sciences as opposed to the other social sciences. So the applied social sciences will be law, economics, uh, business studies, management studies. And the other social sciences, while well, the academic social sciences are sociology, anthropology, uh, philosophy is often Included. Sometimes philosophy is not included, sometimes philosophy is included in, in the human sciences, in which you find literature, <coughs> really sciences of a second, secondary importance in terms of the whole hierarchical structure according to which sciences are, are distributed to today. And that hierarchical structure is something that is maintained and reproduced by the allocation of grants. So of course physics, computer science, chemistry, and so on and so forth are the paradigms of scientific work today, and they're also the fields that dominate the, the granting uh, institutions. So when I make reference also to uh, the way granting and hierarchization is operating and what type of institutional structures uh, are the ones that implement this type of categorization or classification of the sciences, I'm speaking mainly about Canada and the United States, my recent experience in Brazil, to a certain extent France, although perhaps it's not as up-to-date as it was at one time. So what is the area to which business administration belongs in all of that? And uh <laughs> So how, how are we to think of business studies and how are we to think of the PhDs that you are, are working on in business? Well, one of the, thing, of the things about uh, business administration is that as a field, as an academic field, it's a very recent field. And these days in various philosophy programs, there will be disciplines in the philosophy of management, for example. So its importance has, uh, regardless of its novelty or its newness, its importance is clearly uh, fundamental in the university structure. But when we think about business administration or, or P 
PhD in business studies. You know, we find a field that really emerges from the political sciences. And in that sense, you know, we have some, uh, we have a background here that's shared between various uh, areas of political science, which involves political theory, you know, for example, to different big theories like contractualism, republicanism. Now, what, what's contractualism? It's basically the theory that comes to justify and explain the creation of the modern states. It's what happens with Thomas Hobbes, uh, John Locke in the British setting, in the French setting of uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. You know, the idea of contractualism is that, well, there is a state of nature in which uh, we can assume certain legal and even property, uh, uh, private property, for example, exists. But the state of nature in which all humans exist as free and equal leads to conflicts and a counterproductive type of situation, often warfare, depending on which thinker you deal with. And this requires some type of pact, some type of creation of a new institutional structure that will provide at least self-protection to the community, uh, that will divide uh, the state of nature into the state and society, that will implement some type of judiciary structure based on the laws of nature uh, that exist, which are transformed into laws of the state. Contractualism also has its uh, later day variant in terms of Marxism where revolution will signify another degree of a pact uh, to create another <coughs> order based on another series of laws. Republicanism is a fundamental theory on the creation of the republic instead of the liberal state, which is really the, at the basis of contractualism. Then another background science from which business administration emerges is the idea of political economy, the area of political economy when we deal not only of political theories, but of the economic background or structure that orients the economic theories, because of course when we speak of our democracies today, we don't speak necessarily of capitalism. Uh, when we speak of uh, dictatorial systems of government, we don't speak necessarily of communism or fascism. Um, the economic aspect behind the theoretical uh, explanatory uh, structures by which the state is created are two different domains. So political economy is one of those background aspects of business administration. I think public administration is also one of the fields that exists at the basis of, uh, of business. Public administration in terms of you know, the division of state and society, the division of public and private sectors. Public administration also in the sense of governance because when you think about it, uh, uh, philosophy, and particularly Plato, exists at the very foundation of public administration insofar as uh, Plato's philosophy is an attempt uh, to repair the damage done to the Athenian city-state after the terrible all-Greek war of the Peloponnesian War, uh, in which Sparta and Athens, the two leading powers, with their allies engaged in total war, and Athens lost out. Athens, up until that time, up until the war, was the center of democracy, and was the birthplace of democracy, even though it was a very limited democracy, a limited democracy to land, uh, landowners, essentially. Women had no citizen rights, slaves had no citizen rights, only the owners. But nonetheless, it was the place where uh, arts, architecture, philosophy, mathematics, uh, theater, uh, tragedy were all created. Po poetry throughout in, in Athens. And what happens with the breakdown of the Athenian state is the tension to uh, a new grounding for public administration. Plato's Republic is precisely a tract in public administration. But what's the education system going to be like? What's the form of governance going to be like? What type of policy will we have on representations? Meaning, those who represent the relationship between humans and the gods 
in a negative way? Is it useful for the state in so far as setting a moral example to the citizens? Or shall we represent uh, relations that are respectful, uh, morally founded, morally grounded, uh, uh, representations that contribute to solidifying and stabilizing the state? So public administration is really philosophy in another, in a, with another name, particularly when you deal with how both Plato and Aristotle and then a whole series of political thinkers in, uh, in post-Renaissance Europe begin to try to explain and justify modes of governments and modes of state structuring in order to guarantee greater stability. Um, after we deal with these initial centuries of, of questioning, interrogating, and, and, and conceptualizing the idea of public administration, uh, more recently we get to theories of liberalism, which is really at the very foundation of business administration today, particularly in the question of the rights debates between a libertarian approach and a communitarian approach. Uh, how is it uh, that we place fundamental rights of individuals with respect to the state. Uh, libertarianism gives the fundamental rights to individuals over and above any type of collective structure. One of the disadvantages of, of that is that collective structures begin to lose importance, uh, lose legitimacy. In the United States, we find one of the most dramatic examples of that type of situation. In communitarianism, is you know we have a case in which the fundamental rights of individuals are granted and recognized. However, certain types of community structures are also recognized and granted. It's a debate whether this makes sense, whether it's contradictory or not, whether the rights of individuals are negated when you give rights to the community. One case in which we are very familiar with, in which we find the communitarianism debate particularly uh, alive is the case of Quebec, uh, the French-speaking province of Canada, in which uh, the rights of the ethnic majority are held over and against the rights of the individuals in certain regards with respect to certain cultural aspects. For example, the language rights. In Quebec, as opposed to Canada, we have one official language, which is French. And the, the French language charter, which was introduced in 1977 uh, by the Parti Québécois nationalist and independentist government, uh, imposed French in order to preserve uh, the heritage and ethnic community of the French Canadians. Of course, for us Anglos at the time, this type of law seemed to be extremely repressive, particularly when it was accompanied by police actions in which shops uh, were visited regularly to see what would be the language used to refer to customers in the first moment. Because the law stipulated that in the first contact with the customer, uh, the, uh, the shop clerk would have to speak French. And if they didn't, well then, they would receive a fine. Right? So for the Anglo perspective, man, this is ridiculous, man. this doesn't make any sense. However, from the French perspective, you have on the North American continent other communities that stand as an example of what can happen when there isn't some type of communitarian law placed. It's communities such as in, uh, in uh, Louisiana, in the southern part of the United States, which was also a French-speaking community or a French-speaking colony, and uh, today uh, is basically a heritage site for what used to be the French presence in the, the Miami, uh, in the Mississippi Delta. So, what happens 30 or 40 years after the implementation of the law? We have a very solid uh, presence of French in Quebec. Anglophones have left Quebec, uh, and let's say that for the time being, in any case, there's absolutely no doubt about the possibilities of Quebec society to survive uh, perhaps into the next centuries. This is, this is you know, uh, hard to predict on the long term, but at least in the upcoming decades, there's no worry, as there was in the 1960s, of rapid assimilation in a context where American culture, English-speaking culture, 
is far more attractive, even for Canadian Anglophone Canadians, than anything produced in, uh, in Canada. Right? So communitarianism uh, is able to operate within a non-contradictory relationship to the fundaments of liberalism, which is the recognition of the, uh, the rights of the individual. That's very much interesting, uh, if I may add to sure. that. Yes, what do we in Bahrain, if you go to Indonesia today, they start with the English. Even if they realize that you are actually an Arabic guy, they start with you in English, uh -huh. and they will wait for you to respond in order to convert to uh, Arabic or Indian or any other language. Right. But that's very much interesting the way you said it. Is there, is there any uh, concern over the impact? Well, the, there, there is a the concern, Arabic. to be frank. But you can see it more in Bahrain because it's much more open. And you can see it recently in Dubai in the last few years. But if you go to Saudi or Qatar, or Qatar yeah. Qatar then you will have an issue. I Once I wrote a letter to the Ministry of Interior in Saudi when I was actually working in Riyadh. It was in English. And they called me in, uh, and I went, and they said, why did you write it in English? You're supposed to submit only in Arabic. You will be fine, and you will be jailed. <laughs> All right. And I, I was waiting for the head cut. You know, <laughs> but, uh, it didn't. They, they just said, "Fine, this time we're gonna go off, you know, by, by just a verbal warning." But don't you ever try it again. Especially, do not send an English, you know, a letter, or you communicate with any ministry unless you communicate it in Arabic. Yes. That's the same case in Qatar, where all uh, communication to the government has to be in Arabic. Mm -hmm. So we who are uh, experts, you have to employ someone to write your letters in Arabic. So you you have it English, mm -hmm. but has to be written in Arabic for purposes of communicating with the with the, the government. So any correspondence with the government has to be in Arabic. When you get your contract, it has an English version and an Arabic version. And they say the Arabic version supersedes the English yes. if yes. there's any conflict in translation. Yes, yes, you're right. So in all circumstances, the Arabic would supersede. Right. In yes. fact, even till today, and I believe in Sam can concur on this, uh, in Bahrain also is the same. We have to give but they will not find you. They will not yeah. hear you. They will not do anything with you. you know, they will respond to your letter. And you need to trust the people who actually trust the you know, translation. <laughs> <laughs> but you're absolutely right. Uh, there, are, there is a concern. I've heard it in a number of uh, places by the way. Uh, the English might actually, people, they start communicating with English more than they use the Arabic and the fact of them. You can see a real weakness in the way they write or the way they even talk. Right, if I can, if I can just add one other thing, that Donald, my fellow Quebecer, has already tried to shift the question away from the the language debates in Quebec that we're having here in, in Dubai, which might seem a little bit surreal. But uh, but one of the one of the uh, uh, one of the aspects of uh, of, uh, of uh, the language question in, in, in Quebec is the ground and the degree to which it's seen as being responsible. Uh, you know, in Canada, we haven't had a long history of repressive governments, and this type of question turns the Anglophone population really on its head at times. However, there is a solid argument made by the Quebec government because these days, in any case, the Canada uh, is reproduced in terms of its population by the presence of immigrant peoples, uh, peoples from different cultures and countries and, and, and religions and Quebec will have a selection of French speaking immigrants. But when immigrants in the past would argue that well we have a right to speak English uh, because we came to Canada and you know, we don't have to respect the French language and the French question. Uh, you know the Quebec government simply explained to them well this is the territory of the French speaking Canada, and this is something that one has to do in terms of the 
respect shown to the people that live here. So, you know, at times the immigrant population has, has worked as a messenger of the Anglo-Canadian construct. At other times, when Quebec started to take control of the, the, the immigrants and the, 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 the French-speaking immigrants, they were able to administer in a more fluid manner uh, the integration. There are still a lot of problems uh, regarding the nature of Quebec I mean, because of, there are other questions that emerge after about religion precisely, but this is another, this is another debate uh, and discussion that would take us away from the, the main idea. But uh, in terms of uh, philosophy then, so what we, had, what we found on the other slide is basically some of the background sciences that contribute in my view, to the creation of this field, which is business administration or managerial studies, and, and furthermore, to the PhD in business. Right? Now, as I was saying, in terms of philosophy, uh, what are some of the, te the trends that we see in, in academia? Uh, and this is one of the purposes of this presentation, is to give some type of academic uh, 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 shadow to what we're doing in a more professional context. Well, one of the, the transformations in, in recent decades that we found is that the liberal arts, which used to be the foundation of the university system, uh, has been transformed into the, uh, uh, into the human sciences as a, as a designation, uh, separated off from the hard sciences. Philosophy then becomes a human science. And then the human sciences are submitted to parameters of scientific research and then become social sciences. Okay? So this is, these are some of the transformations that characterize the division of faculties in the, in the university setting. Within uh, the area of philosophy and social sciences, we find a few internal divisions then we find a theoretical, and a practical, and an axiological division, specific to philosophy and the social sciences. We'll have this theoretical dedication, which is more philosophical, or exploring the philosophical background. The practical dimension, that is applied to the areas of administration, law, and economics, which seek for recognition as something more scientific than is characteristic of philosophy. And then we have the axiological theories, which is, I guess, ethics, and particularly ethics, which for a long time accompanied <coughs> philosophical or religious or moral thoughts. But these, these, over the past few uh, decades, has manifested itself as also more, perhaps not scientific, but definitely more logical in structure by showing the logical models of argumentation that are behind various types of ethical theories. Uh, the whole relationship that we find in ethics is the relationship between the means and the ends. Uh, what justifies means, what justifies the ends? Well, all of this is done not arbitrarily, but by creating arguments. And the arguments don't refer to some outside force to be legitimated or to be seen as valid or solid, it applies to the community, or it refers to the community, submitted to the community. And we have a big so social political theory by uh, Jürgen Habermas that is a theory that tries to create new grounds for democracy, new grounds for interaction, an intersubjective type of democracy in which the role power, centralized power, uh, is diminished, mitigated, in favor of the uh, convincing power of good arguments. So this whole analysis of the logical and the model theoretic aspect of, eth of ethical arguments is something that has made ethics prone to be taken on by areas outside of philosophy as well. Today, perhaps in terms of this tradition of different subdivisions leaving philosophy to be uh, uh, you know, to take on an independent existence, say from philosophy, ethics is probably the most recent of these 
of these fields, which would be, of course, disastrous for philosophy to lose ethics completely. We'd be back to some type of uh, uh, theological or religious supplements. Uh, why? Why? Why would ethics leave? Because this because there used to be a group, right? Number of elements. These, of these, these, we find a lot of professors identifying themselves as professors of philosophy and ethics, yeah. or philo or professors of practical ethics. We're going to come to a subdivision in a second of, of ethics, how we see it from within philosophy. But just this division of philosophy and ethics. Well, ethics has traditionally been a part of philosophy. Why is it necessary uh, to to separate it? But we'll see shortly in what context we can really speak about separation. I have a question. Sure. Uh, related to what you just said. Uh -huh. um, if, I think you said that if we left, if, if ethics was no longer a part of philosophy, then we, being philosophy, would return to theology or something. Is that basically what you said? Yeah, a supplement to uh, theology or, 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 or a guide or be placed at the service of, of religious thought. Because ethics, you know, when we think about the big developments that have occurred in ethics over the past few centuries, but which is also representative of, uh, of ethical systems that emerged in the post-Renaissance period, ethics is at the foundation of secularism. Philosophy uh, articulates its separation from religion, from the Christian religion, by means of establishing the individual as an autonomous, rights conscious, and uh, rational articulator of what his or her responsibilities are to fellow human beings and to the state. To articulate this dimension of rights, one does not need to refer to scripture. So ethics has pressed away at this dimension of the autonomous nature of the human individual and the community, as opposed to uh, the uh, reduction of all of philosophy to uh, articulating the more theoretical aspects of Christian, of the Christian religion. So, if philosophy loses ethics, it will lose its contribution to the secularization of culture in the Christian countries. And that's why I suggest that perhaps philosophy, one of the effects would be for philosophy to return to religion, or philosophy would simply contribute to uh, a, a positive. Uh, or positivist explanation of the sciences. Because one of the big questions about ethics is that, well, we have the sciences working according to a concept of truth which is descriptive. Concept of truth that works according to correspondence between sentences, propositions, equations, and the phenomena that exist in the outside world. So, in the level of philosophy's contribution uh, to the exact sciences, the description, for example, of consciousness, the description of the levels or the 